Hello everyone, my name is Zach and welcome to my channel. Amongst other things, I'm a reenactor and a jouster. And recently I've had some requests for a video on shields. If you have any requests at all for something that you want me to talk about um, or any questions or anything, do please leave them in the comments. I love reading the comments. Um, they really inspire me to do some new videos. So uh, thank you to William and to Ryan and to Martin who made this request. So I really like shields. I like them a lot. Um, you'll find different jousters um, seem to like their shihuds different amounts. Some kind of, I think, treat them as a, um, a necessary evil, while as uh, um, others like to really show off um, and make really cool ones. Uh, I am of the second opinion. And so with these shields, this one here and this one here, um, I had to go to my friend George to get them painted. George is an amazing craftsman. I'll put a link to his details in the uh, description down below. But basically these shields have been, um, well, I gave George some blanks and then he covered them um, and gessoed them and painted them all in uh, completely authentic, um, all with completely authentic methods. So I am so pleased with these. I, I love these. Um, they're absolutely great. Um, a few points about them. Um, this one has been covered in silver leaf before being painted with oil paints. And um, from a distance, you can see it's very, very shiny. And then the closer you get, the more details you can see. Now this is something you see on historical shields all the time. They need to be easily recognizable from a distance, um, but they also need to, um, to look really good close up as well. And shields in jousting are disposable items, and yet they made them look absolutely awesome. Very often people will look at jousting shields and go, oh, they must be a parade shield. Well, I think that is completely missing the point of jousting. Jousting is like a competitive parade. So when you ride out onto the tournament field, everything you wear is something that is showing everyone how great you are and how rich you are. This is covered in real silver. This is covered in real gold. And historically, that is absolutely correct. Um, they would decorate their jousting shields in such a way as to make people sit up and pay attention to who they are. Um, now, like I said, um, these are designed to look good from a distance and from close up. But very often, by the 15th century, you do not see people's coat of arms um, on the shield in the way that you normally think. So this is the coat of arms that I joust under, um, the golden castle on a red field with a yellow, with a gold border, okay? But um, that's not the whole story. So you, you do often see the coat of arms on it, but you see other things added as well. So, um, I've got part of my motto on it and I've got some vines. You very often as well see figures maybe carrying the shield with the coat of arms on. This, um, this is all part of the performance art that is jousting. Your shield is showing more than just your family coat of arms, but something about who you are as well. Um, now this shield I had commissioned um, for a different reason, okay? This does not contain my coat of arms at all. And this is for a, a different type of tournament called a pasta arms. And in this, uh, this pasta arms that I organized was based on one that historically was called the, um, the pass of the golden tree. The pass of the golden tree was a Burgundian past arms that took place um, in the late 15th century. And um, it was one of the Burgundian uh, nobles 
uh, took on this persona of the Knight of the Golden Tree and stood against any challenger that would come at him. Right? And this kind of thing of relinquishing the family arms and um, playing a part, playing a role, I found really, really interesting. Now, I don't actually have any evidence that a Pass of the Silver Tree ever happened, but there's so much stuff um, about, uh, uh, about jousting that is just so individual. And I do think that that individualism should be um, championed and should be encouraged in, in jousting. Um, one of the problems that we have in looking back is that we look back with a modern sensibility that everything should be categorised. There should be one set of rules and everyone should agree on it and uh, uh, it should be codified and written down. And historically that didn't tend to happen. Uh, we do have a few tournament books where people have taken it upon themselves to write down how they think something should happen and what equipment someone should have. But these are people um, who are kind of like shouting into the wind. They're saying, this is what I think should happen. And everyone else is just like, yeah, great, great for you. I'm going to carry on doing what I'm doing. I feel like I've gone on a bit of a tangent there because this was meant to be about shields. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this Taj uh, before I finish. So, like I said, the, um, the face of the shield is very often in the 15th century not painted with the arms of the person. And when it is painted with the arms of the person carrying it, it is... Uh, um, it is part of a larger image and it is much more detailed than just their arms. Uh, they were extremely lavish, they were extremely detailed, but they were also considered expendable items. So a lot of the Tajes from the period we just don't have left because they were just trashed and, um, and thrown away. Um, or sometimes they were, um, they were given in as gifts to people as well. Um, now, one of the things that uh, um, I've got on my Tajes, which um, a lot of reproductions don't do, is I've got uh, staples instead of rivets for holding on the straps. Um, now, this is important for me. Now, uh, one of the things that I try and make sure with my um, equipment is that everything is possible to fix relatively easily. These staples um, hold the strap on and uh, um, they, unlike a rivet, if a rivet gets damaged it can break the whole shield. These are completely covered on this side so they cannot be struck um, and we've actually got a weak point that is an introduced weak point. It's an intentional weak point and that is the strap. If these straps come under any uh, extreme stress then the strap will break rather than the shield breaking. The reason for that is that a strap costs you know 20 quid um, whereas a shield costs an awful lot more especially if it's as lavish as you would expect a tournament shield to be. So rather than having the rivet be the uh, going all the way through being the weak point. Um, here we have the strap being the introduced weak point. Now um, even if on a riveted shield the strap were to break you would need to do a lot of work and remove the rivet in order to be able to re-rivet a strap back on which again is going to ruin the shield um, and and all of the hard work that has gone into it. So I would recommend that anyone who's planning on having a shield made, um, staples are the way to go in my opinion and you do see them on uh, historical examples. Uh, you see staples, you see hooks uh, being used as well. I think maybe if I ever get another shield I might look into the uh, staple and hook um, design and maybe do a video about that then. So. Thanks very much for t tuning in. Sorry, I kind of went on a bit of a tangent at one point there. Um, so the things that I kind of wanted to say, shields are disposable. 
but they are also extremely lavish. Um, and if you're having one made, go with the staples, not the rivets. So all the usual stuff. Uh, if you like this, leave a like. If you have any questions or requests, please do leave a comment. And uh, um, if you haven't already subscribed, uh, please do that. That would be very much appreciated. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.